Welcome to this week's Message Connect. We're so glad to have you with us this week. Our prayer and our desire is that the Lord our God would take the content of these Message Connects and use them to encourage you in your personal relationship with Jesus as you discover God's purpose for your life. This Christmas, we're taking a closer look at a few people that God chose in key roles. That very first Christmas story that we find in Luke chapter 1 and 2. And you know, many times we think that we know this story largely because of our familiarity with the images of the nativity scene. The point of this study this year, as we look at the Christmas story, is we really need to understand that the original Christmas story and its setting was very messy. If you're anything like me, I have a, a tendency to, to read people in the Bible, these different characters that we see throughout Scripture, and we think that their lives were perfect. We think that people like Mary and Joseph didn't really struggle with anything, but they did. They were just regular, ordinary people like you and I. They had real problems, real dreams, real hopes, real fears, and real aspirations. In fact, the way that Matthew begins his gospel, Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament, and the way that he begins Matthew chapter 1, he begins with a long list of names. It's kind of like Matthew, I think, is kind of putting together the family tree of, of Jesus here, and, and he kind of gives us this kind of compelling introduction to the story of the life of Jesus. So he gives us this long list of names in Jesus' family tree. And what he's doing is he's telling us who Jesus was related to. So the point that he's trying to make is that Jesus' family was really messed up as well. Jesus was born into less than ideal circumstances. You read through Jesus' family tree and you see who he was related to. And There was a liar, there was a cheat, there was a prostitute. Jesus had a few cousin Eddies in his family tree as well. Jesus is perfection born into imperfection so that you and I might have the hope of being perfected. That is the heart of the Christmas story that God gives to us. The Christmas story is a story of a God who came to us. Emmanuel, God with us. You see, what Jesus did is he lowered himself. He humbled himself. Now, the question that we want to consider today is simply this. What kind of God or deity would do this for you and I? The one true God would. He comes right down into our messy circumstances to give us hope in Christ. You see, the, the story of Christmas is that God stepped into our humanity. He took on our humanness to free us, human beings, by being involved with other human beings. There is nowhere that this is truer than the group of people that I want us to look at today, the angels and the shepherds. Mary and Joseph, as we looked at last week, are in these unfortunate circumstances of, of bringing Jesus into this world. They go to Bethlehem. There's no room for them in the end. They end up in a barn, a stable, a cave, and Jesus is born there. You know, a place that keeps farm animals, a place that's pretty messy and doesn't smell the greatest. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. So after Jesus is born, we see these shepherds are out close by in, in the area of Bethlehem. They're watching their sheep. Now, when we, we hear about shepherds, shepherds in the first century, they would not have been old enough to even grow a beard. They would not even been respected in their culture at all. Most of them would have been young boys who had been abandoned, sold into slavery by their families to pay off debts. They didn't have a father. Uh, they couldn't hold any kind of public office. They couldn't even give testimony in a court setting. They were the lowest of the low. Now listen, to be a shepherd, this is what you did when there was nothing else for you to do. To be a shepherd meant that you had no family. You were a sort of a nomad. This is what you did. You just kind of roamed the countryside. So you got this group of marginalized nomads, these shepherds. They're out on a hill watching their flock by night. So they're huddled up in the field at night. The sun has gone down doing who knows what. In verse 9, it says, Suddenly 
an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, once again, I don't know what you visualize when you think about angels, but I'm pretty sure harps and wings and halos and diapers had nothing to do with an angel. Angels were large, intimidating figures in the Bible. Anytime that you see a description of an angel in the Bible, it's almost like they're warriors. They're mighty. The shepherds are huddled up in this dark field, and all of a sudden, boom, there's this great light that is shown. The radiance of God's glory and light illuminates them. I mean, this, this had to be intimidating, let alone this intimidating figure standing in front of them. you know. And so here's the position that we see the shepherds in. Their only response were, was to be terrified. They were afraid. I bet they were. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says, But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. In other words, the angel's like, I didn't come here to beat you up. I didn't come here to bust you. you know, I didn't come here to call you out. You know, I didn't come here to push you down any further than what you already are. Don't be afraid. In verse 10, he continues by saying, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. Now, the emphasis is on the word all there. Everyone, even you, shepherds, people like you, especially those who feel unworthy, unqualified, unloved, which, to be very honest, isn't that all of us? How many times have we felt unworthy in our lives, unqualified, or even unloved? In Luke chapter in Luke chapter 2 verse 11 it says the savior yes the messiah the lord has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David in other words this messiah who has been prophesied for 400 years he's here he's here tonight he has been born in verse 12 it says you will recognize him by this sign you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Now, there's probably not too many babies who were sleeping in a feeding trough that night, lying in a manger. So they say, go find this one, this baby boy, lying in a manger in a feeding trough, and you will know he is the Messiah. In verse 13, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. You always see this pattern in Scripture. First you hear, and then you go see. They're like, wow, we've heard this wonderful message. Let's go see this. we got to see it. So they go on a road trip to find this Jesus. In verse 16, they hurried off to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' stories were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. I wonder what Mary was really thinking. Do you ever wonder what Mary was thinking that night? Can you imagine being in Mary's situation? She's sitting there thinking, I just gave birth. I'm a virgin. I'm in a barn. My baby is lying in a feeding trough. And all of a sudden, these nomads, these shepherds show up in the middle of the night asking if they could see the baby an angel told them that she had given birth to. So she's got to be sitting there thinking, why would God give this message to these shepherds? Why wouldn't God send a message to the innkeeper so that he would have a room for me this night? But here I am. I'm in a barn. And this is so unusual. Now there are shepherds here. In verse 20, the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. They went back to their regular routines, their regular lives. Something was different. They were glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. Wow. 
I think the reason why God includes them in this whole narrative is because fundamentally these shepherds were changed to their core. You see, what God had done is God had announced to them the coming of the Messiah. They were the very first ones to hear about it on that special night, that silent night. And God would announce it to them. And then he would turn them into the very first messengers. Now here's the deal. When the radiance of God's glory was shown, in other words, when God turns the lights on, it changes things. And for them, it changed everything. When God turns the lights on, it changes our hearts. It changes minds. It changes lives. When God's radiant glory, His light shines, it changes the world in which the light shines. This is why Christmas is the celebration of lights. This is why lights come out this time of year. It's one of my favorite things about this entire time of year. Christmas lights are symbolic of Jesus because Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light that came into this dark world. Now, where they got this idea is from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. He prophesied this would happen. He said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And that light is Jesus. That is the message of Christmas. In this cold, dark world, the radiant glory of God once showed up on that silent night in Bethlehem. And that light that came first when Jesus was born, that light will come again when Jesus Christ returns for a second time. Before God, will ever bring a light into this world, this dark world. He wants to bring light into your life and into my life. Before God begins to reshape and reorder this dark world in which you and I live in, God needs to reshape and reorder our hearts. I hope that our prayer today could simply be, God, would you bring light into this world through me? You see, God's looking for a few courageous people like Mary and Joseph, like these shepherds, a people who are willing to step into the light, a people who say, God, please shine your light on me first. God, would you simply turn your lights on me that I can turn this light on into this dark world? You see, when God turns the lights on, this exposes you and me for who we really are. Now, this is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now, I want to tell you, when God turns this light on in your heart, in your mind, in your life, it's an uncomfortable place to be because we're used to kind of hunkering down in the darkness, hiding in the dark. We're really good at putting on masks. We're really good at masquerading in the dark. But when the light comes on, it exposes all that. Light actually shows you something that you don't see in the darkness. Light actually reveals some things that maybe you and I need to address in our lives to, to come clean before the Lord. You see, when God turns the lights on, he will drive out all your fear. Fear is where we tend to hide. Fear tends to hold us captive. Fear thrives in the darkness. And many of us stay in the darkness because of fear. Fear of what might happen. Fear of what others might think of us. Fear of failure. Fear of what God might do or what God might say to us. And that cycle of hiding in the fear permeates us, holds us hostage. At some point, we have to be willing to step into the light. And when we do, what light does is it exposes the darkness, the fear, and we find a God who says, don't be afraid. The very same thing that God says to everyone through an angel every time he appears, don't be afraid. I am with you. Jesus said, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Fear not. He says, the angel says here, I bring you great news, great joy that's for everyone, for all people. Don't be afraid. That's what happened when light exposes the fear within us. We see a God who can be trusted a God who loves us, a God who is full of joy and hope in the midst of our hopelessness. You see, when God turns the lights on, he will redirect your confidence 
Now all of a sudden you have confidence to tell everyone. Here are shepherds who didn't even have a voice in culture and they're telling everyone, we met this Jesus. And it says that everyone was astonished at what they said. Why? It wasn't about them and it wasn't about what they were promoting. It was Jesus Christ in them. Jesus first changed them. They encountered the baby Jesus and it redirected their confidence. God is a promise keeper. He can be trusted. We have a God who is for us and not against us. You see, when you find your identity in and through Jesus Christ, then you can be others focused. That's what happened with the shepherds. They met Jesus. And when they met Jesus, it caused them to be others focused. You know, you, you need to know about this Jesus who's been born, the Savior of the world. There isn't anybody that you and I lock eyes with every single day who isn't looking for hope. People are looking for kindness, looking for encouragement, looking for the light of Jesus Christ. Do they see that through you and I? This is what should make this time of year the greatest time of year. It's not about the food. As much as I enjoy the special treats and food that we enjoy this time of year, it's not about the gifts. It's not about the Christmas music. It's not even about the movies on the Hallmark Channel. It's not even about the holidays. It's the fact that God would step out of heaven and he would step into a group of people just like the shepherds, just like you and I, and he would redeem us. He would transform a people who would encounter the life of Jesus Christ within them. That everyone that you and I would come into contact with could see Jesus Christ in us, and through us. That is the significance of the light of Jesus this time of year. But not just this time of year, every day throughout the year are people experiencing the light of Jesus through us. Today, let's simply invite God to expose us for who we are. Allow the light of Jesus to come to our life, expose us so we can drive out fear and redirect our confidence, not in who we are, but in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. The Message Connect questions have been provided in a discussion guide for the study. The Message Connect is focused on helping you to take the next steps. The next steps are designed to help you to dive deeper into God's Word. We want to challenge you and encourage you to take these next steps. At Ringel, we believe that growing people change. And to grow, we need to start talking. Talk through this. We need to start thinking through this. Start sharing, just like the shepherds did. We need to start praying and asking God to work in us first, that we can make a difference in other people's lives. But also, we need to start doing We need to be the light of Jesus today. Let's get started. God bless you.